You know, when investigators arrive at a scene, one of the biggest questions is always, when did this happen? And believe it or not, the body itself often holds the key. There's this incredible biological clock that kicks in called rigor mortis. It's like the body becomes a silent witness. And today, we're going to learn how it tells its story. So how can a body possibly tell its own story? I mean, that's the fundamental puzzle for any forensic investigator, right? When someone can no longer speak for themselves, how does their body communicate the truth? Well, it all comes down to a series of predictable, almost clockwork-like biological changes that start the very second life ends. And one of the first, most powerful clues they look for is rigor mortis. In simple terms, it's the stiffening of the body's muscles after death. Now, it might just seem like a natural process, but for an expert, oh, it's so much more. It's basically a biological stopwatch that gets triggered the moment someone dies. Okay, so why does this even happen? How does a body go from being flexible to completely rigid? To really get it, we've got to go small. I mean, really small down to the cellular level. We're about to explore the tiny, invisible shutdown that makes every single muscle in the body just lock up. Now, here's where things get a little weird, kind of counterintuitive. You'd think we need energy to, you know, flex a muscle, right? To make it tight. But the key to understanding rigor mortis is a tiny molecule called ATP. And its most important job in our muscles isn't to contract them, it's to relax them. Yeah, you heard that right. ATP is the energy source that lets our muscles let go. So what happens when you run out of it? They get stuck. So let's walk through that cellular shutdown step by step. It all kicks off when the heart stops beating. No more blood flow means no more oxygen getting to the muscles. And without oxygen, our cells can't produce any more of that crucial ATP. The little bit that's left over gets used up super fast, and once it's gone, that's it. The tiny filaments inside our muscles, called actin and myosin, they grab onto each other and they literally can't let go. It's like a permanent handshake. And that tiny microscopic lock happening in billions of cells all at once is what we see as full body rigor mortis. Okay, so now we get the why behind it, but what about the how? As in, how do investigators actually use this? This is where the science gets really cool, because this biological process turns into a practical, usable tool. It becomes that post-mortem clock we've been talking about, and it follows a surprisingly predictable timeline. You can almost set your watch by it. It doesn't happen all at once. Usually about two to six hours after death, the stiffness starts to creep in, often in the smaller muscles like the jaw and neck. Then it spreads throughout the body, getting more and more intense until it hits its absolute peak right around the 12-hour mark. At that point, the body is at its stiffest, but it doesn't stay that way. After that peak, the process actually reverses itself as the muscle tissues begin to break down and the stiffness gradually disappears over the next 24 to 48 hours. Seriously, if you take one number away from this, make it 12, 12 hours. Because when an investigator finds a body that's at peak rigidity, completely stiff, that's a huge clue. It gives them a really strong benchmark, suggesting that death happened roughly half a day earlier. And trust me, that one piece of information can completely change the direction of an entire investigation. But, you know, real-life investigations are rarely that straightforward. This biological clock, it's good, but it's not perfect. It can be sped up or it can be slowed down by a whole bunch of factors. And for a skilled investigator, those little variations, they're not problems, they're more clues. They help them read between the lines and get a much clearer picture of what actually happened. The single biggest factor that can change the timeline? Temperature. It's actually pretty simple when you think about it. Cold slows down all chemical reactions, so a body left in a cold place will hold on to its ATP for longer, which means rigor mortis sets in much more slowly. On the flip side, a warm environment speeds everything up. The body burns through that leftover ATP way faster, and so the stiffness can appear in just a couple of hours. This is why it's so critical for investigators to not just examine the body, but to, you know, read the room, literally. And it's not just about the temperature. Think about it. What if someone was in a violent struggle right before they died? They would have already used up a ton of their ATP, right? So rigor is going to set in way faster. Other things matter too, like certain poisons or even pre-existing illnesses can totally mess with the body's chemistry and throw off the timeline. And this is what makes it such a powerful tool. It doesn't just help answer when someone died. It can give you some serious clues about how they died too. All right, let's do a quick recap. Rigor mortis is that post-mortem stiffening of the muscles. It's caused by the body running out of ATP, which, remember, is the energy molecule needed for muscles to relax. This whole process works like a forensic clock, usually hitting its peak stiffness at about 12 hours. 
But, and this is a big but, that clot can be affected by things like temperature or the cause of death. All of this together makes it an absolutely crucial tool for any forensic investigation. And you know what's wild? Rigor mortis is really just the first chapter in the story a body tells after death. It's just one piece of the puzzle. It really makes you think, doesn't it? What other secrets is the body holding? What other clues are just waiting there for us to find, long after a person's story seems to have ended?